take two. Welcome, Ian. Just uh, how are you doing, first team? <laughs> Great. I'm just proving that it's sunny in the north. The sun's <laughs> beating through my window. People won't believe it. Where are you now? So Where about? Uh, Warrington, mighty oh. Warrington. So yeah, we get a lot of rain up here. So yeah. you've nicked my sun. It's gone now. Mine's got dark clouds out there. But um, yeah, hope you're well, mate. Just uh, for those who are uh, just joined us who may not know what you do, just tell us a little bit what you do at the moment with the FA. Yeah, so uh, my current role is um, I'm, I look after the the FA YCD team, which is a, a group of 20 coach educators uh, that work in the pro game and and support all the, the coaches working in, in the academies. Um, so my particular uh, sort of age group is up to the under 18s. Right. Um, so that's so I lead that group. Um, just before that, I was leading on futsal. So I've led on futsal for the last five years on coach education. Um, so that was great because it, it included, it allowed me to get involved with the national team, with the senior men's team. Um, it really helped me, it allowed me to sort of drive a, a project around, around futsal. Um, and helped me, uh, and something that I'd actually started beforehand, which is how I got into futsal, was was with the partially sighted team. So we've had some great times with that particular group, um, you know, getting them to be second in the world at the minute. So, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've had 10 years at the FA, so um, well, probably more than that now. So doing a variety of roles was in in the grassroots game beforehand as a county coach, as a, in a, as a county coach developer, basically, when it was all regional. So yeah. did that job for five years as well. So been around here a little while now and just, let's just take it right back to the beginning to a young mm. boy 20 years ago yeah. um, <laughs> did you uh, <laughs> what was your what did you play football when you were younger yeah loved it loved it and it's funny you you think about defining my sixth birthday was a special day first time i went to see man city 2-0 at home against burnley um never forget walking out into the ground and seeing this big green pitch in front of me and just thinking wow well funny that the day before uh, we'd been in the park. We used to, my mum used to take us to the park loads, and that same day got my first kit. So it was like 19th wow. of April, 1976, yeah. first ever football kit. Go and see City playing, and um, yeah, just I, I can see it now. And it was, I think it was hooked a little bit before then, but that day there was just no turning back. I was committed to City, which basically was then 30 odd years of torture, and then uh, <laughs> yeah, so just love playing. Just everything it got me to school. You know, if if I went to school early to play in the yard, I would. Yeah. It was just play, play, play. You know, you, I, I, I look back now and I was probably playing six or seven games a week. You know, by the time you got to fourteen or fifteen. But the the problem was then I, I sort of just didn't do myself any favours. And by the time I was like eight, was six, sixteen, I was a late developer, which was so it was always a fight. But yeah. then got kept getting injured and then. Um, yeah, but just love the game. Absolutely love the game. It's just the best thing ever. And yeah, it's it's terrific. And then and then kind of got into coaching out out the back of that. How, how did you get into coaching? Ian? So yeah, it was it was funny actually. Me, um, I, I, the team that I played for. So I played for a, 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 the same Sunday team from being kind of eleven up to being thirty. Pretty much wow. the same group of group of fellows. And right, right at a time we got to about eighteen. Man City used to open their training ground in Moss Side, which is in a quite a tough part of Manchester. Yeah. Um, so the training ground was owned by the council, but then they put on these coaching sessions. And there was a guy, he didn't run the team, but he took us on training on a Thursday night called Tony Whelan. And I don't know, pe- people might have heard of Tony. Tony's um, is a youth coach at Man United. He's been there probably for about 30 years now. So oh. it's right through the academy programme. And has been instrumental, really, in... in um, you know, you think about right the, the players that United have rolled out from you know he's from Beckham and before them and since he's he's been part of that. Um, yeah. And he he saw something in us and gave gave us my first coaching opportunity. Um, and it was funny. So he said, "Oh, do you know, I'll put you in touch with the Bobby Charlton's soccer school." Yeah. So first of all, he, he told me to go and do my prelim because um, he'd been seeing I'd been having trouble with getting injured. Then um, then he gave us this opportunity for a week. Within the first hour, he says, you're loving this, aren't you? I went, yeah, this is better than the work that I was doing. And um, so then he said, well, I'll phone Bobby Charlton's soccer school up. They, they need, I'm sure they'll need people. But he gave us a bit of an advice. He went, just realise that football is such a small world. And that, you know, he says, keep your nose clean, work really hard 
and you'll always have work. Yeah. And it was the best bit of advice I ever got because then jobs would come from the, I don't know, people chatted or whatever, but I don't really feel I've had a proper interview ever since and I've managed to stay. So I went, I went to do one week's work with Tony and then um, went for, I did a, a week's work at Bobby Charlton's, went in as a boy pretty much, he asked us to go back and stay after the, the summer season had gone and then ended up being managing director there after about 15 years later. So, it, but it was great because it, it, it allowed me to work in schools that, at that point, there wasn't any, um, there wasn't community programs. There wasn't, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't anything. Football was pretty much schools football. Um, grassroots wasn't quite kind of what it is, but it gave me an opportunity. One, to be around some really, really good coaches. Mm. To be around Bobby Chant was pretty decent as well. So <laughs> you know, that, that was just incredible. And, and some of the experiences that we got from there. But it was... Um, it allowed me to practice a bit and work out what kids like and, and how they worked and, and what kids engaged with and what they didn't engage with. Um, and that it sort of teed me up, really, for, for what was going to come. Um, mm. My mum always thought it was a terrible move to go and be a coach. You couldn't really see it. She wanted to have a proper job. But I've managed <laughs> to hang in. 31 <laughs> done, years later, I'm still hanging in. I'm doing all right, well, I think. You've done well. Did you always want to be a coach just when, when you used to play? Or was it ever... Um, you no, I wanted to be a player. Absolutely wanted to be a player. And um, and yeah, the late development. I'm an April birthday, of course I was really small. And then just suddenly grew at six grew at sixteen or seventeen and then um and I, I did have a chance, but then broke my collar and and that was just like my dad just went, You're having a laugh. Every time you go out you get injured. And <laughs> and he's, and then this so he um he kind of said, you know, have a reality check. And um, which was probably the best. He wasn't a football person by any stretch. Um, and I got in. So it was just like, a, well, I've got a job in football here. And, yeah. uh, and then suddenly you were, you were going all over the country with Bobby and you were going all over the world with different coaches. And I'm like, this is really good. I get to see the world. I'm doing something that I just really, really enjoy. Mm. I'd spent um, a year after leaving school working in a bank which was just the wrong place for me, 100%, um, to the point of you did the same thing at the same, a bit, bit like being on lockdown. You did the same thing at the same time every day. Yeah. I was indoors. It was just not the right thing. So so when you realised you'd got a job that was like just the, you felt it was the best thing in the world, I was not going to let anybody take it away from me. And, um, you know, and, and that was the, that, I think that was the thing. So you yeah. work really, really hard. I've got Tony in the go in the back of my mind going, "Don't let me down, Don't let me <laughs> down." I'll, I'll give you this, you know. I've got you this, or put you forward for an opportunity. It was like make the most of it and and see where it goes. And and yeah, we're still going. But I wouldn't I wouldn't say you see at that time I don't think there was coaches like mm. there was now. Yeah. Um, you know I don't know how many. There was you did a prelim, which was um, which was um couple of weeks course uh, evenings but it but it was funny there was a guy there called um and it's funny how things move around so there was a guy called graham keely who was the the, the county coach at cheshire fa and, um so i rocked up this night to go and start my prelim and i remember him getting out of a white Vauxhall cavalier so <laughs> some people know what, what i'm talking about the people out of a clue <laughs> well this guy was ultra smart and i just remember him opening the boot and getting a bag of balls out and it was like, flipping out, he's got a full bag of foot. He's got 12 footballs there. And I'd never seen 12 footballs <laughs> in one place at one time. And Graham, if anyone was coming, he's, he, he was involved with the Parsley Society team. He got me involved with that. So our paths kept crossing all the way along for, for, for years and years. But he was immaculate in his FA gear, socks rolled up. He was smart. And it, it I just thought, who's this bloke? Never met in the world, but he had such an impression. And I just thought, wow. Well, one, I thought, I'm out of my debt. But then two, I thought, I want to do what he does. And, yeah. and then he talked about stuff that was just, you know, have you thought about how you strike the ball? And, you know, when you connect with it, how you need to follow through and what part of your foot are you using? If you kick here, it does that. If you, I've never thought anything about this. And, um, and suddenly it was, this whole world was just opening up in front of me. And, um, yeah, it was brilliant. <laughs> did, did, you yourself, did you get yourself a Vauxhall Cavalier? Do you know what? Funny enough, I did have a black Vauxhall Cavalier <laughs> when I was at Bobby Charles, and my dad put it around a tree one night. 
So <laughs> it came to a bit of an abrupt end. But yeah, I did. I did the very same. Since, uh, especially um, the cars, <laughs> Moving on to, um, <laughs> but you spent some time at Bolton Wanderers, uh, Bolton Wanderers Academy as well, didn't you? Yeah. So towards, after about, um, I'd done my way for B licence. And it was about the time that the academy programme came into into play. Um, th- yeah. I think it was the second year. And a guy that worked with us at Bobby's uh, was a teacher in Bolton. And he said, oh, I think they're looking for some staff. Um, so, yeah, got got involved, did five years as a part-time coach. Um, funny enough, by that point, because we did Bobby Charlton schools and Man United schools, but, and that was just going through the roof. Um, and after five years, I, I had to go to Chris Sully, who was the academy manager at the time. So, look, the, the business is just, you know, I've got two young kids. The, the business was really taking off. Mm-hmm. Um, but then a couple of things... You, it's funny sometimes things change a little bit and then he, he phoned us out of the blue just to see how I was and said you know what we've got a full-time opportunity would you fancy it and I'd been really intrigued about um so big Sam was there and so a lot of the the, the training days Sam knew everything about the club and he wasn't mm-hmm. just about the first team it was and it wasn't just about the first team in the academy mm-hmm. it was about the whole town so he knew everything about the town he knew everything about the club and and he made you feel special. So even on training days with the club, I thought, this, this is brilliant when I come in here. And, and, at, and at the same time, you were going to all the FA sort of um, sort of uh, days around sort of development days, which really got me excited all the time. Mm. And and I, th- and I thought, as so when Chris said, oh, and it was pretty much coming, if you, if you want to come in for a chat, and I go put my suit on. Don't really know what's going on. But two minutes later, I'm in the office with, with Big Sam. <laughs> and he's quite a persuasive chap. <laughs> and, and, I, and I come out thinking, oh, look at that, that's put the cat amongst the pigeons. I've got some <laughs> thinking to do. Is this this would be really terrific. And they wanted me to do recruitment. So I ended up, I did, I've been a, a, a part time coach for five years with the 12s, 13s, 14s, around that sort of age group. Um, so then we got into recruitment. Can you come and do recruitment? I hadn't done recruitment, but I'd got quite a few links with football locally. Yeah. So it, it kind of made sense. Um, and then one thing led to another, and I sort of ended up being like assistant academy manager. So looking after, yeah. looked after recruitment, looked after the coaches, basically. Um, and do you know what? We, we did all right. It was a great time to be at the club because they were never out of the top six in the five years that it was full time. They got yeah. into Europe, which yeah. was incredible. Um, the 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 people will probably have an opinion of Sam, but being around him, so it was it was just one of the best one of the best people ever to work for, and was an absolute privilege. And um, passionate about the club, passionate about the team, got the best out of everybody, whether it was a, a player or whether it was a member of staff, and just made you feel super special. And um, mm. yeah, it's a good, really, really good time to be at the club. Um, you know, and and we produced players, so players like Kevin Nolan. We we yeah. got released from Liverpool. Liverpool released him at um, as an under fourteen, too small. Grossbert, then he's as big as a barn door. <laughs> um, we had Ricardo Vazte, who came on trial, just literally turned up off a plane from Portugal. Um, interesting enough, a late birthday in Portugal, scored four in the in the first. 20 minutes of this practice game <laughs> and it was like don't let him leave the Reebok until he's <laughs> so we yeah, we had in Joey O'Brien again late developer um, yeah, you know we, we we did Kyle Bartley who, who might, people might come up he was at Arsenal he's at yeah. Swansea and um, yeah, he, was he was well sorry yeah. Yeah, so, so we, we we did alright we did we did pretty well with players and yeah. it was it was kind of um but well, just great experience. And and every day I'd pull into the training ground thinking, crikey, what am I doing here? As Nicholas and Elka pulls up his Rolls Royce. <laughs> and it was like, just couldn't really understand what was going on. But it was, yeah, good experience, terrific times, learnt loads, um, you know. And it was just, it ended up being really good just being around players day in, day out. It was, it was terrific. Yeah. No, that's good, mate. And um, you joined the FA, as you said, like 10 years ago in 2009. Um, and you covered many different roles, which again, which you've alluded to there. 
what what is it about futsal that, that took you interest? You spent a predominantly a lot amount of time with, about futsal. What what is it that that interests yeah. you? Why is it so important to you? Well, it's funny. So when we're at, if we go right back to well, if you go back to Bobby Chance, we did loads of stuff around games, and I figured out that the best thing that kids liked was games. They didn't want drills. They wanted games. Mm. Then when you get to Bolton and and we started, we, we it was before the youth awards and. And um, so we'd looked at stuff and we had some research done um, from John Moore's university, which is out there. And it was about the, the types of practice that clubs, whether it's grassroots or academies or whatever, or centres of excellence at the time, were delivering. And and basically it was saying, um, you know, there was too much uh, unopposed practice, not enough games. And um, and it was really it. And then we, we looked, so we'd have this research done on us and... And then it went, we went, oh, we're really, we're releasing players here because they make poor decisions. Mm-hmm. So when you looked at the types of practice they were doing, you thought, well, we're not putting them in situations enough where they're making decisions. So we came up with this 4v4 programme. At the same time, Man United were doing 4v4 games. And then you think, wow. And we saw some massive changes in the, in the types of, in, in the players that, that we had, that we were working with. Um, so, so, um, so that was... That was so that was always in there. Then I go to the FA, Graham's there. Graham, so I bump into Graham, we're working in the Northwest. Um, so this is the guy with the white cavalier who took me on my prelim <laughs> sort of now. This is 15 years on. So Graham's at the FA, takes the Parsi sighted team, and we're having a cup of tea when uh, I need an assistant with the Parsi sighted team. All oh, right, that sounds good. England team, you know, one of the 20 odd England teams. I said, Oh, that's brilliant, that. What, what seems, oh, well, we have a tournament a year and so many camps and, oh, brilliant, yeah, really competitive. Okay, we don't win much. Oh, that's all right, but let's go. He says, oh, by the way, we play futsal. I went, foot, oh, okay. <laughs> so what's that then? So um, went down to Hereford. We played a game against Bath University. I think Sean Kitson was playing, who's now the assistant coach with the, the, the mainstream team. Um, and it was all those kids running off and running on and it was 5v5 and it was loads of goals and it was dead exciting and and Graham went, what do you reckon of that then? I went, well, oh, it's pretty good that. <laughs> said, uh, that looks really good. I don't really know what's happening but it looks really good and that was the start of it and then we went um, the first tournament we went off to Turkey and played and got, got well, that I was involved and we got we got pretty much thumped and yeah. um, but that that was the the, the 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 that got me hooked into it, um, and I could start to see the correlation between what the work we we're trying to be doing at Bolton to to this work, uh, and it all seemed to align. Um, and then you'd, it's funny sometimes you don't know who's in the room. So the Advance Youth Award had come out, and um, and they'd asked me to go on as one of the regional coaches and as an FA staff, and it was like a pilot course at the time. And I was put in the um, because of my work with the, the with the partials. The um, I was on the YDP, sorry, the PDP phase, mm-hmm. the older group players, and and I happened to do a presentation about we'd we'd just come back from um, might have been in fact I'm pretty sure I think we'd just come back from Japan, and um, did this presentation and Dan Ashworth who was about to start was in the room who became technical director. Um, lo and behold, I didn't know that they were trying to ex- they wanted a specialist coach looking at like skills and techniques to work in the academies. Yeah. Well, then he saw this presentation and went, Oh, he says, I've heard a bit about futsal. Um, I think rather than doing this skills type curve type role, this might be a better fit. And yeah. it kind of aligns with what UEFA want as well. So, UEFA um, want all the big nations to do futsal. So, um, they asked me, would I mind coming out of the grassroots game to work within the pro game to, yeah. you know, devise, look at what we'd got. To, and Pete Sturgis was doing a terrific job with, we kind of got the level one, level two award, but they wanted a UA for B to be a, you know, sort of a, a to, to, to get that online. And it just, mm-hmm. it just seemed a really, really good fit. So and that was it. So got involved. Um, and then, so I had five years really trying to, shape the program and do you know what I, I, brilliant brilliant time it was mm. only sort of last summer we had one or two changes and again was asked just to have a little bit of a change of would, would have mind kind of leading our group um 
which again was a fantastic opportunity to one keep the futsal fire burning a little bit, but again yeah. huge challenge around sort of linking in with a license, driving the AYA, you know, and and, and other awards. So yeah, yeah. decent mate. Yeah. And you touched on it there about the link between the FA and the Premier League and Football League clubs in, in your role, yeah. like trying to introduce football futsal, sorry, into their academy programs. How successful yeah. how successful was that? In the academies? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what the the it's probably and I know Louis Melville's on the side, so he might be able to tell us something different here, but uh, and feel free, Louis, if you want to uh, to jump in. They, they they probably offer one of the biggest futsal tournaments in the country in terms of um in terms of budget it probably is the biggest tournament um i would say in most i would i've been into probably 60 odd clubs sort of explaining futsal yeah. um there's other clubs that i've been in that that haven't that will have somebody that's doing it so most clubs will have had a taste um I think what you're finding now is there's some real experts within certain clubs. So Sheffield United is a great example. They've got a guy. So when they go to tournaments, they let the football expert take the team. Um, some clubs have really implemented it on a on a weekly basis. Um, the North West, interestingly enough, there's so the, the the Premier League really look after the, the Cat One clubs. So they have a tournament which runs starts in um, back end of October, so November December. They have finals yeah. in February. Um, they have, it, it, some of it's a festival. They have a knockout regional and then they have a, a residential finals. Yeah. Um, I think Chelsea was pretty much wiping the board last year with most of the finals. But um, it's got to look more like if you watched Barcelona playing futsal, it, it, I wouldn't say that it looks like that just yet. But, yeah. but certainly it's competitive. There's some You can see the teams that are trying to make it really futsal um, if that's the term. Um, so it has it's evolved over five years. Um, the Cat Three clubs in there's there's a weekly tournament on a Saturday morning that Preston North End host for mm-hmm. the other Cat Three clubs. And um, so every week teams turn up. We do nines one week, tens the following week, elevens the week after. It means if it does rain on a Sunday that that those groups have got a game. Um, mm-hmm. They run it competitive. They keep a league table um the winners play you know the top four play off the winners get a trophy um they play they turn up they play for sort of 45 50 minutes um and that's and again the coaches are a lot of them have come come and got you a for b license we've, we've put courses on for the clubs yeah. and it, the clubs have recognized that it gives them something now interestingly enough the cat three clubs a lot are based at, at schools rather than having their own facilities so they've oh, got okay. this sports hub that, that lends itself, one for training, um, but then for matches. So what you'll find is older Athletic have got a, a, a base at a school. They will invite Accrington over for a game on a Wednesday night with their under 10s. And they put the kit on and they go toe to toe and they have a, a, a full on war. Um, you know, so it, it's the, the clubs, they, they've they're having a really good go with it. And I think one thing that we push on the Advanced Youth Award is about different formats of the game. You know, if you go to, um, I think most clubs, and and this is where I've got to understand that the, 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 I think the, the extreme, the futsal gives you real extremes. So the surface, the ball, the goals, and playing yeah. to lines, that, that's really, really, well, not, some of it's really different. So if you, I don't know if it's a sliding scale of 11 aside and, Futs out, then you know you could play five e five on a three g, mm-hmm. and that's somewhere in between. Where if you want to go really hardcore and really test players, so things like, you know, when you can't play back to the goalkeeper, you've got mm-hmm. to be able to go forwards. If you can't, if you if you kill yourself by having a poor touch to go back, you're absolutely stuffed before you've even started. And, yeah. and I think that that's the bit, you know, so people say, oh, yeah, you can't go back to the goalie. What's in it for the goalie? Well, I'll tell you what's in it for the goalie. He gets about 50 shots. We did, well, the stats on the Premier League tournaments, they were playing, um, well, let me think, they were playing, um, I think, two 12-minute games, so 24 minutes. The goalies were getting 40 or 50 shots to save. Wow. Um, the distributions, they were getting about 30 distributions because some shots were getting blocked. Yeah. Plus then they might get, played back to from a goal kick 
So they were never out of the game. They were always in touch with the game because, they, you know, they're never more than 25 metres away on a on a 32-metre length court. Yeah. And you just go, well, I'm not really having that argument that the goalies aren't involved. So, um, yeah. you know, it's... it's and, and you can see that it really suits some players, but doesn't suit other players. Yeah. And um, and that's that's fine. But actually, what the clubs have started to understand is actually the the, 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 the player that suddenly thrives at futsal, maybe at 12 or 13, that, that might not be the biggest, can't get round, you know, a, a 9v9 pitch mm. and can't influence the game by the ball going inside, can really take care of the ball and can t- take care of himself. And that's the bit that they're starting to see. And then Good. they're less likely to release somebody after. In, in the same way, you could have a, I want to say a big unit. You could have a big unit whose yeah. his control's not as good, runs off the court, keeps running out, hates futsal because he has loads of success at football. Excuse me, loads of success at football, but then doesn't get the success at futsal because he's not got the, the room to work in. Now, mm. maybe I'm biased because I was a late developer, but you never know. Sticking with the ones that can play could give them yeah. a, a, a chance. Um, you know, and, that, and that's similar to, um, you know, it's it's similar to the Max Kilman story. That if yeah. people are aware, of, Max is, is you know is playing down at Maidenhead. Um, we had him on a, one of the webinars recently. Um, Mike Scabala interviewed him, and, and he talks about. So he was at Fulham as a kid. Um, got really uh, well. The story's brilliant. At 11 or 12, he was the best kid and was one of the better ones. So they wanted him to stay till he was 16, but he didn't sign, I don't think. By the time he was 14, he hadn't grown. And now it's a real tussle to get into the games. Yeah. Um, then by the time, I think by the time he was 15, he got released because he couldn't get around the pitch but and hadn't grown. Um, ends up going to Maidenhead on their youth programme. Um, starts playing futsal at around a similar time. Um, then he, he grew, like, I think around about 18, he just started growing like mad. But when you look at it, he was getting really competitive football games, you know, mm-hmm. playing around that conference, and and the winning was important. By the time he got to first team, very important, is around, um, I think he was playing um, at Genesis Futsal, but he got into the team, so that was competitive when he played on a Sunday. Yeah. And then he was playing, he was training with England, so he was with really, really good players. And then, um, you know, and then suddenly he's trying to win competitions in Europe with futsal with England. And playing, you know, in the conference, so he's getting the, the argy-bargy yeah. of the conference, argy-bargy of futsal, because it is a real contact sport. Um, but but he's got to head it at the conference, but he's got to sort his feet out in futsal. And you mm-hmm. look at it, it's like just the perfect storm. And then he's he's growing as well. You know, he's he's ended up so the the kid that was too small is now six foot five and yeah. um, you know an absolute beast and you know and and it's it's just funny how how things change over time um, you yeah. know so you know yeah, like, things things do move on things yeah do, do you on. think I just touch just quickly before we move on just around Max and um, how obviously. Um, you know, I can't think of his name now. It's lost me. You know, the, yeah. the Portuguese coach at Wolves. Obviously, at Wolves, foot yeah. foot foot big in Portugal. Do you think that had any um, like influence on not, them signing? No, not when they signed him, uh, um, because they didn't know. It was only quite recently that oh, okay. um, that they really found out. the The scout actually saw him playing for England futsal, playing against Wales. Right. Um, so, um, which was, I think, he'd, I think the story went that he'd, he'd been on, they'd got a tip off around the Advanced Youth Award because we'd, we'd actually played, um, Max had been in playing for like an under 20s futsal England team against Bournemouth's under 20s in like as yeah. part of the AYA. And someone, and he was the best player by a mile, even then. But again, there was a, a room full of 100 coaches. No one really nibbled apart from this guy who'd come back a year, year or so later. So they'd seen him playing, and then he started following him on his on his um, maiden their journey. But um, I don't think it's a coincidence. You know, he, he can play. He's a centre. He's a. I mean, he's left. He's a left left footer. Um, he's a. Set, how many English left footed centre halves have we got that can play a bit? There ain't so many. Mm. There really isn't so many. Um, the way Wolves play, if Max has probably got a weakness, it might be pace. Real pace in behind. 
well, Wolves don't, you know, they're happy to, you know, yeah. we've got some stats about defending really deep, inviting pressure on and, and dealing with that. And um, so he kind of suits, he kind of suits what they do. Yeah. Well, that said, I mean, he played in the Europa League game as, as a left wing back. Um, you know, but he, what Max, the webinar is fascinating. And, and I can't, you know, if it's on FA, it's on the YouTube channel. Um, it's worth sort of an hours of anybody's time because yeah. you know it tells a lot of the stories that you know about the the late developer, the playing different formats. Um, probably spoiling it now, but the, <laughs> he, he talks about. Then he talks it. He, it was about the only the only time he said the only time he's got anywhere close to when they're popping it about in training. He says it was like being back at futsal because the speed of the ball so quick. Oh, okay. because of, you know what the the, the polished floor and. And the ball that goes in and stick, you have to punch the ball really fast. So he's yeah. saying, well, actually, I, I could step into the first team training when he's gone up from the 23s, and he could cope. Um, not, sh- yeah, yeah, he's, he's yeah, he, and, and so th- it does make you wonder whether he, he's caught the eye for a particular reason. But yeah, big, big boy can deal with the ball, and uh-huh. and the stats, by the way, we, I mean, we carry with the seniors and the mainstream lads. We have, um, we could. We have some real in, in and for the last we've had them for three or four years, and it's a route football hasn't really taken yet. So it tells us um, it, not about impact that players are having. So we mm. can we can um, we know who has an impact, which four on court have an impact together, who doesn't work with each other, um, who's best at seeing games out, who's best at getting goals, and it's a bit money bally stuff, but it just tells you what you're seeing with your eye. But Max's stats were the best by a country mile, even though he, he kind of looked a little bit laid back in but no, best, best, best by a mile. That's so good. That's good. Great role model. No stats, don't yeah. um, um, Louis said as well, EFL T programme had 50 clubs at one stage and will merge with the AOC next season. So we'll be the biggest futsal league for under 19s going forward and will include f- female futsal too. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, the football league, pro- that was a great programme. And, and again, that was in before I started. So that must be um, probably about seven or eight years ago. And yeah. the clubs were providing futsal and um, for, for people sort of 16 to 18. Um, and again, in some places, um, so Grimsby had some real success with it because pe- boys were getting released from the academy and then going into the, if they couldn't get in the academy at 16, they'd come and play in the, the um into the futsal program and yeah. they had a good coach with them uh, and then they got some players going then back into the football at 18 with yeah. the club so some really good stuff um and really well run um it's kind of lost its way a little bit but it's um which is a bit of a shame because i mm. think we've gone more into football, yeah. um but yeah uh, some, good, some good evidence of but good the, practice as well yeah, yeah no there's some great work and and the stuff Louis doing and and there's there's some real um, I don't know it's taught, it's taught me an awful lot about the game and, and around attention to detail um, because if if your details wrong in futsal you've got absolutely no chance and yeah. and there's this we we have built um, quite I won't say an army just yet but it's getting like that of of people that really get the game and understand the game. And then the players that they're working at with are starting to really see the benefit of, of the types of work that they're doing, which is which is terrific. Oh, that is good, right? Yeah, and he also says, our coach at St Mary's University and we averaged 61 shots per game last season. Goalkeepers definitely involved. Yeah, it's an absolute nonsense that people <laughs> say they're not. And, you know, and, and you look at Van der Sar, you look at, you know, Alisson, you look at... Um, um, De Gea? Oh, De Gea, De Gea, yeah. yeah. And... Um, and Edison at City. And, you know, they can deal with it with their feet, but then you look at the saves that they make and yeah. it, they're identical to what you see in futsal and handball, you know, the same way Schmeichel would, would come out. So, yeah. again, we've, we've looked at that. We've put some, if I'm, if I'm selling the FA, get on the boot room. Um, you know, we, we've filmed with England keepers and what match day looks like. We've we've filmed um, sort of some basic techniques and skills work as well. So there's there's a series of videos, which again initially with few A for B, but we've put them out there because it's wasted with a you know a cohort of fifty a year. We want them, and yeah. you know they get a thousand hits. FIFA are all over them. They love the work that's been done oh, um, because it's 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 really good. But it applies. 
I think it applies to, to football. It clearly applies to football. It applies to mini soccer. Um, and, you know, why wouldn't you? Why? I, I don't know. My mother-in-law's a barometer. When, I mean, I've got a lad who's 21 who she she would come and watch maybe once in a blue moon in playing football if he got to a final. But then um, once he started playing futsal, she was asking to come because it was warm. It was Sunday <laughs> afternoon and it was warm and, and there was loads of shots. And within she'd been to see one game and she went, oh, this is quite exciting, isn't it? I went, mm, yeah, it's quite good. Yeah. And, and the, about 9-9 nine, nine, the first game she came to. So but from that point, she was hooked. Rather than free, being freezing cold, stuck on the side. Um, yeah. yeah, she was in. Not a football person. Maybe it's just <laughs> common sense. It's warm in the winter. <laughs> what, what, how do you see the future of um, the futsal in the country? In terms of, I, again, I was on your, your Twitter the other day and you responded to someone who took like a video of um, like a court, if you remember. Yeah. And you said that there's hundreds of these across England and that it's just trying to change that mindset. Yeah. Because a lot of people, and again, these people have been on the call, we've had previous chats before around like, facilities being a bit of a, a stumbling block and maybe the cost mm. as well. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's a, if you listen to Sport England, they'll go, there's X amount of sports or there's absolutely thousands of sports halls. The, the trick is to get them unlocked. That's, that's the real challenge. Mm-hmm. So that's one challenge. And then the cost of them when you do get them on lots is, is, can be a bit, bit tasty. Um, but I think there's a couple of solutions. And, and, and I think, so the, the point about the tweet was, um, you know, there's, in, where I, in, the, in our town here, there must be 20 or 30 hard, um, hard cord surfaces with, with metal railings around, with goals already built in. Um, mm-hmm. And some are better than others. Some are bigger than others. Some have low fences, some have high fences. But you've got the surface straight away. Um, funnily enough, there's about, there's about 10 that are floodlit, which are free. And yeah. once, you know, once you go, they're floodlit. And, the, and basically, you can go to the, the, you can get a permit off the, um, off the council. So if you want to go on there, eight o'clock for an hour, you can have it whenever you want. And, yeah. um, and, it, and it's, it's, it's an absolute cracker. Um, so I think, and, and then the other thing, of course, is, Every high school's got three or four netball courts. Every primary school has got a netball court. Um, they've probably got a, a set of Samba goalposts stuck away in the um, in the store cupboard. So put all that in the mix, and you, you're off and running. And, and yeah. all you've got to do is go and play. Um, so you've got lines. You, the court's worked out for you. If you just need it. So I think there's a snobbery sometimes about um, about you know facilities we don't need you know if you go to brazil then we're playing on concrete courts if you want to if you if you've got netflix you want to have a look at um, a program called concrete football and it's about um it's about paris um and it's a bit it, there's a culture there of this street football which is all on concrete some of the pitches are like a deer decahedron they're not even a they're not even a rectangle and um but they play to the goals. They've got sort of pretty loose rules, but it's mm. competitive. Um, and and by the way, France are suddenly rocketing up in the in the futsal world. But that's come from this real. Yeah, I mean they're top twenty now, and and three years ago they were where we you know same they were on the same level as us. Um, mm. Drew with Spain in the first round of, of the Euros last year last time out. So. You know, there's some really, really good stuff going off. I think we've, and as coaches, I think we can dictate that. And mm. I'm not really having the health and safety bit. Let's let's scrub that off because if if you know it's going to work, you don't you don't slide tackle. And you know these are these are on in in Paris. These are men playing on concrete. If you go to Spain, it's men outdoors on concrete. Um, yeah. If you go and play netball, you know, I could say the right thing, but it's generally girls that play, women that play netball. They yeah. play outdoors. In the winter, sometimes it's raining, and it and it's not as slipping as dangerous as what people think, and yeah. it doesn't need to cost a penny. And 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 I think there's a real part of me just just I get used to get so frustrated when my lad's grown up and running his team, games are called off, and you're going, oh, let's go and play a game, even five e five on the three G, let's go and play that. No, yeah. why not? Let's just get the lads toe to toe, go and play a game. Bring your t- we'll play two games. No, yeah. and 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 we've got to get away from that because one we're losing too much play. Um, 
it's the best thing you can ever do as a kid. You know, yeah. if, and if our job is to put some stuff on for people, let's go and put it on, whether it's on 3G, whether it's on courts, whether it's on, you know, a hard surface on a netball court, let's go and do it and and, and go and play on stuff. And and that's, it's it's doesn't cost a penny. It does not mm. cost a thing, um, apart from having a broad mind to go, go on, let's do it and understand what we get by playing on those surfaces because the rest of the world do it. Yeah. You know, and they're producing play. So we're actually speaking to the Brazilian FA, sort of on a sort of myself, Mike Scabala, Ian Parks, who's who's kind of took them over my role, and and what futsal like, but what youth football looks like. And they're saying, yeah. oh, they they want structure and monitoring players before. And we're going, no, you have what got five World Cup medals up your sleeve? You know, you produce players left, right, and centre, and that's coming from all this small sided. Football, futsal football, not rushing to 11 v 11. Um, you know, yeah. Portugal's the same. You don't play football unless you're a hell of a futsal player. It's all done on hard courts. Yeah. And it's just a different mindset altogether. And and we've lost our way because we rushed to get to 11 v 11. And when we've not even nailed down the bit about small numbers work and dealing with, it, with, it, with the ball. And, and I think you'll find... I think you'll find a real shift for ourselves because I think we're, as an FA, we're kind of a little bit to blame on that. Um, you know, about really going after small sided, really going after trying to help the individual. Um, yeah. And, and understanding what you get from each game. And don't go to the next bit until you've really mastered this this first bit, which, you know, when you hear Sturge talking, that's 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 a lot of what he's talking about all the time. Nice. Nah, great points that you made there. There's a couple of guys on the call who are interested in doing like 3v3s. You know, like yeah. at nines rather than doing fives, just to again, I suppose that just trying to keep it as small as possible at that time. Don't rush. Yeah, that. yeah. Just going on what you're saying there. Yeah, I mean United. You know, United had a they've had their four v four program for, and as a City fan, it, it oh, it's it's hard to say, it, but it's the best thing ever. They've done it for twenty years. You know, you go to watch one of their under six or under seven sessions. They're playing three v three, four v four. I think the trick is they don't they're not just left to play. The coaches are highly skilled. So they're getting these returns, they pop in, you know, they challenge the kids, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do the other? And that's that's the coaching. And it's all done within the games. Um and it's they've just turned over, they've just produced players left, right, and centre, you know, right through all the leagues. Breaks mm. me out. <laughs> yeah, um, just to remind people, if you do have a question for Ian yeah. about futsal or anything, just pop it in the chat. Um, in the last hopefully 10 minutes um, I've got loads of questions which I'm not going to get through Ian which we're pleased to know um, just got a question coming out actually let's get straight to it yeah. Liam um, so he's just talking about 3v3 without goalkeepers yeah. small goals small pitches is the way forward for the engagers yeah. lots of high intensity competitive mini matches yeah and, and this is the thing it's about it's about understanding what you're getting from those so mm. if you don't play with goals you know you're probably going to get loads of dribbles and getting over the line or if there's, you know, or if the goal's on guard, you're going to get shooting from distance. So, yeah. you know, know what you're getting. But I'll tell you what, 3v3, you're going to have to love the ball. You're going to have to be able to deal with the ball. Yeah. There's no hiding place, you know, which is, which is again, there's no hiding place for the player. There's no hiding place for the coach. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, the, the four does give you sort of length, breadth and width. I think that's yeah. where four might be different from three. But again, yeah. let's just understand if it's three, um, you know, if it's if it's three, then you're going to get more of the ball and you, you get less of the other. So, mm. you know, just understand the constraints, um, which is it's what we've got after. Um, okay. Room foot stuff. Ooh, hello. Well, yeah, so <laughs> people at Manchester, what would you say? The, what would you say the differences between curve and foot style? Yeah, no, that, I mean, the curve thing at the time was very much around individual skills and techniques. Um, quite a lot of it was unopposed. Um, I'm sure that's moved on. I'm not, I've not been tight enough for, for a little while. Um, but the, 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 and the thing with the foot, with futsal is, I think people's, um, if they go on YouTube, they'll see a Portuguese guy called Ricardinho dribbling past people and, and doing amazing things. Um, if I had to sort of sum it up in a, in a five minute, in a, in a sort of 20 second message, it's, well, less than that. It's a two-touch passing game, and it's around passing and movement. And yeah, it's handy to have a couple of dribblers, but it's two-touch and passing, and that's what futsal gives you. And it gives you such such high levels 
around thinking and, and, and trying to think quickly. And, you know, it, it's bizarre when you look at, you know, let's go, you know, if you look at the, the money men in the City team, your you David Silvers, your Agueros, your Jesus, they've been born and bred on this. De, De Bruyne said he played it in Belgium, mm. you know, but that's been there. So is there any wonder that they're, you know, the, the best number 10s are coming from Spain, Argentina, Brazil, you know, where, where it's played loads. And, and yet we've had a little bit of a struggle in that department, really. Remember the last real number 10 we had was Gaza. What did Gaza yeah. like doing? Playing loads of games. He was always out in the park. Rooney was kind of a little bit similar. And he'd class himself as a 10 rather than a 9. Yeah. You know, they were just wanting to be in amongst it, making decisions, tight area work. Um, that's the real bit that futsal gives you. Um, you know, which which we don't understand. That's not in our culture at the minute. Mm. Um, we've kind of lost it. But, it, I mean, people, as I, I go back to when I went to school, we played on the yard before school at break time, at lunchtime. We played with different sized balls. Mm. Um, we played with narrowed off goals because if the goals were too big, you could just leather it and it was too easy. So you put mm. the rubbish lad in the nets, you made the nets quite small, and then you had to at least work out how to try and score past him. And that's 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 what you got brought up on, yeah. and you know there was a million kids running all over the yard, and we didn't fall over all the time, and I, and I think that's you know there's got to be something in it that that play. Good point. No, I I had a similar like lunch times and even before schools as you say there, and it, the best times like it made me smile when you said it. So it's great, yeah, best times. I can't imagine me going to school. I think it was <laughs> PE and. PE got me there one day. Games got me there another. You had to be at the team meeting on Friday for the game on Saturday. <laughs> that was half you. You had to go. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I just I just want to talk around. Um, oh, no, we've got another question in. There oh, you there go. We go. This is good. This is good. Right, so Liam says, yeah, how, how can we get ahead of the curve with youth and grassroots football instead of playing catch-up with the rest of Europe? Good, good question. Good question. And, and it's a bit weird, right, because I get, I get where you're coming from. So, but then the other thing is then we've got no end of countries looking at what we do. Bearing in mind, a couple of years ago, we, we won the men's game on everything, you know, every age group. I think they didn't lose a game in normal time, you know, from 15s up to, to under 20s, um, which was just a phenomenal, you know, they lost a few games on penalties or whatever in, in tournaments they went into. So, yeah. Countries are looking at us and they're going, what are they doing? Because it's really, really good. And I think with the, the young players that are coming into the Premier League and um, and some of the success we've had, you know, we keep saying, all oh, we need to change. But then actually other countries are going, it's pretty good what you've got. Mm. And I think a catalyst for that might be St George's part. That might have changed one or two things, perhaps, because suddenly all the national staff are in a place. I, d I don't know. Um, so I think you've got, you've got to put some sort of balance on it, that actually yeah. we're, we're, we're in a pretty decent place. But um, but I think, yeah, so, so, you know, are we producing, Premier League's the best league in the world. We are getting players into there. You know, if, if they can, the, the challenge I think we have got with, at that level is, um, is, you know, an average age of a player coming into Premier League is about 23, yet we're expecting an 18, 19 year old to do it, English. Four hundred and twenty-three. Well, actually, that's not a fair playing field. So we need to come up with a way. Max, for example, twenty-two when he signs for Wolves, with all this other experience. So you know, there's an argument there. I think, I think the the our coach education system is the envy of like most European countries, and they're looking at us to see what we're doing, and mm. the you know the fact that to the team that I'm and you know the the, the work team of coaches, if you like. When they say, oh, so what do you do? Well, we, we go into the clubs. We go, you know, the lads look after five clubs each. Um, so pretty much they're going into a club, different club every day. Um, and they work alongside the coaches to help the coaches get better. You know, in the same way, we've got the mentoring programme, you know, within, within the counties. Yeah. In the same way, we've got county coaches. When they see the structure that we've got, they go, wow, that's incredible. When they look at the numbers of kids that are playing, they go, crikey. Everybody plays football in England. How how's that happen? Yeah. So you know the Brazilians are saying the same thing because but what we've probably lost if the is around all of our stuff is structured, you know where 
I think we've sometimes just got to let the kids loose and let, and let them go after their own stuff. Um, and it, it was really interesting. I mean, me lads, we, we um, I took his grass. He was in a grassroots club called Crossfields up in Warrington. Um, and we chat at standard club, community club by the end of it. And, um, you know, but that took some shaping to get where we needed to get. The bit mm-hmm. that intrigued, we had six, six teams. I remember we had six teams that was, and um, so that was like 60 lands and, and and basically the league said the league rules you've got to put your, your best kids in the A team and all the rest of it and that's sort of the league structure this is yeah. 15 20 years ago so I, I know things have changed in some places but then but by what was really and then so we did all this sorting kids out we took control as parents then um, and clearly the best kid, and this stuck with me the best kids wanted to be be in, they wanted to go to war and go and play and be really toe to toe with kids. That's what they wanted. And they kind of that from six to eighteen, that's how they rolled. And, yeah. and I didn't realise that at the time. And this is, this is me coming through the program. But the bit that really confused me: by the time we got to thirteen and fourteen, all the clubs locally in Warrington were the, 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 the squads had been sorted out in the schoolyard, had nothing to do. So by that I mean. If you went to the Catholic high school at the bottom of our road, they formed X team. If you went to another school on another estate, they ended up playing for another grassroots team. And mm. they were all a reflection. But then you might have... So we still ended up with three teams by the time we got to under 15s. Uh, 11 aside, still had about 50 kids in the club. So we've done really well at retaining. Yeah. And which, which was, was the driver. But then the... the the A team all went to one. Sorry, the A, the A team was a mix and match of kids from across the town. The B team was like a certain group of kids from the Catholic school, and the C team was like a certain mix of kids from another school. And and that's but they selected. That's how because they were with each other every day. And it made me think. Do you know what? Did we really mess it up by trying to sort the teams out when actually they just want to be with the mates? Social that, corner, yeah. Yes, social yeah. corner was massive, and and I don't know. I, someone probably needs to look at a little bit more tight at that. But whether that was just a fluke, but the whole town, you know, this <laughs> club, that school, this this particular group of pals. So, um, yeah, I don't That's know. That's good. Some, that. some more questions are flying in, Ian. Yeah, uh, on, this is, uh, Tyrone says, "What was your coaching philosophy when coaching futsal?" And I'll add on to that. Does it differ a lot, or is it? Um, my philosophy, right, okay, so my philosophy is different when you're going toe-to-toe with some Ukrainian blokes that want to kill you and, and you're trying to win a World Cup medal. Your philosophy is you'll do what it takes to, um, to win the game. So where I think if I was working with my lads team, it wasn't that at all. It was, it was quite different. Um, but at the same time, I've, I've always tried to help the players. Um, I've always and the, and the best coaches that I've known have always really known the players. Um, mm. So you know we've got a group there. The, the partially sighted lads have been around them for nine or ten years. Know them. Most of the lads um, start. I'd give the debuts to bar I think two. Um, a lot had come through as 16, 17 year olds, so I know them really, really well. Um, I'd really care about them. The social side again is is massive, um, and I don't think. And, and it, but, but they've grown into men now, and, and it, there's a real sort of it's about the winning and it's about high performance. And we've got to second in the world, we can't beat Ukraine, but we've got to second in the world. And it's, yeah, and and you know what? And sometimes it's about the playing style. We went the last World Cup, we were without a couple of particular players who really made us tick. Um, and we had to go really quite direct and, in, and into, a, into the top man and play off the top man, which is one way of playing. The time before the Euros and the time before we got to the World Cup final, um, we played like a real smooth, we were trying to get passing and playing and moving, but we didn't have the personnel to do it. So right. um, I think it, uh, when you get to elite performance like that, then you, you sometimes have to adapt. And it's it's been the same with the um, with the senior group, with the, with the main, main, um, mainstream group. We played Poland a couple of years ago, and it, I think that was probably the best performance we had. We had a, a group of, so within one group, and this is where futsal really puts you on your toes, because 
we had a, a sort of one four that were quite a, a sort of ball playing four, if you like. Mm. Could take care of the ball under loads of pressure. Poland are, you know, the top, probably top 20 in the world. We, we were at that point we're in the 40s. Um, they would come after you, but these lads could keep it. Then we had, um, at the other end of the spectrum, we had a group of four that were just ruthless and would just rat and smash. And clearly, you know, you've only got 5,000 so you can't go booting people up in the air, but really athletic, big boys, really fill the court. And then we had a, a sort of a, a bit of a mixture four in between. But it meant we could really change the tempo of the game whenever we wanted. Mm-hmm. And with the rolling subs, you can do that. And and it that still sticks out in my memory as one of our... Max was playing in the, in the ball of four. Um, you know, so it really stuck out as you've got to cut your coat according to your clock a little bit. Yeah. But, but that said, I've been always one for... Um, you know, with, with the partials, it's their team. You know, I've, I've kind of, so after the last World Cup, Steve Dada, the captain, who's got 140 odd caps, uh, and, you know, he's, he's going to take the team on now. Um, and I'll mentor him along the way, but he's going to lead okay. on that. Yeah. And, 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 and that's right because, um, you know, he's got his AYA, he's got his B license in foot and foot. But you're wanting things to be able to carry on when you're not really there. Mm. Um, so, th- you know, that, the philosophy of, of the players having a real ownership and you, you, you get the golden ticket when you sat in a room, you know, you've had a game when you've won or lost or, or drawn, you've come off the court, um, you're teeing up the next game, you so, you're setting the problem um, for people to write on out here. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, you're setting up the team and they're coming up, they're solving the problems because, you know, you talk, they know the, other, the opposition the, yeah. they've got a way that they want to play and you're all on the same wavelength or you know at least having the discussion and you go well, yeah I'll have that bit but I'm not going to quite have that bit um, and we've, we've got we've got the mainstream futsal lads to that similar point as well um, you know where it's, it was really about them because they've got to make the decisions on the pitch yeah. so you know let's they've got to be they've got to feel that it's theirs and it is theirs and they own it uh, in a similar way if, if, if people look at how a lot of the rugby teams operate it seems to be coach heavy at the start of the week, but then as you, you know, on a, if because they have a futsal, you have it like a, you, you know, in the, in the last tournament we played, I think six games, seven games in eight days, it was it was relentless. Wow. You know, rugby rugby will have a, a gap, a week's gap, but they'll load up with coach, you know, dominated by the coach at the start of the week. By the end of the week, it's the players that's running the sessions, mm. and and it's and it, and it's. I think the the fact is that they're making the decisions in the moment, and they've they've got that autonomy to to, to go and do that. But that has, yeah. you know you have to work to to get to that point. I think you touched on it really to start your answer as well around knowing your players, and we've done tons of these webinars, and it always gets mentioned. And the importance of it of knowing your players is, is huge, isn't it? It is. I mean, we've you know I've, I've, we've had lads with mental health issues, like serious mental health issues. Um, you know, and, it, and sometimes it is about getting in the car and just driving and going and seeing what the problem is when it's got that bad. Mm-hmm. But you, you know that, that that bad point's coming. Um, you know, we've had lads that's nearly gone to prison. How are you going to support them in that, that situation? You know, it's tough. And, I, and when I set out, I didn't expect to be dealing with some of that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's, there's times, one lad, you know, he nearly went to prison. He could have lost his job, you know, he's... He did lose his girlfriend, blah de blah de blah. Cool, blimey. You know, it's it's tough, tough times. But actually, are you, when it comes down to it, are you going to stand the corner? Are you going to back them up? Are you going to give them the support you need? And 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 the, the really th- nice thing now is that you know um, is the players that I'm thinking back to the grassroots club. If I'm round as they're doing the shopping on a Saturday morning or or whenever, the lads are coming up. Hi, oh, yeah, Ian. How are we doing? You know, what are you up to? Bum 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 bum. And I'm really pleased to see you. Mm. And, I, and it that you, yeah that's that's the bit and if you don't know you've got no chance of helping them making them better um and when it gets tough and you know in the heat of battle against yeah. ukraine you you there's like a real band of brothers mentality that that group have um which yeah is, is just phenomenal excellent uh, one more question from matt and i've got one more question. I appreciate we're in stoppage time now, Ian, so I'll be yeah, quick as I can. Yeah. Um, uh, Matt says, my son, um, oh, and Torrance said, thank you, Ian, totally agree. 
Um, Matt says, my son under 11 is love, futs uh, love futsal, plays up a year or two at the local organisation in Milton Keynes, Mavericks. Uh, the thing that seems to be missing around here anyway is a futsal league for his age group to play regular matches. Is there going to be a push for maybe leagues like the grassroots football and from a national point of view, I suppose? Yeah, no, yeah, no there's, um, there's some really good stuff going off in different places. So um, the Bolton Berry League, Again, I, I'm not from Bolton, but it just happens. And, and is it coincidence? Yeah, it is coincidence. 100% it's coincidence. The, um, they, I mean, they pretty much shut down in, in November, December, January, and eights, nines, and tens, and, and go indoors. It rains an awful lot in Bolton. So basically, they, they did a deal with the council. They've hired literally every sport, school sports hall on, on Saturday and Sunday, and the league goes inside. Yeah. Um, did a deal, did a deal, mass deal. And, and they've got a chairman who's really on it. So um, that proves it can be done. Blackburn's pretty similar. They they There's an indoor centre there that they use. Yeah. Um, and there's some real pockets where it's happening. Yeah. Um, I think I think the bits, uh, and this is where, uh, as an FA and a county FA, you know, I think we, we our job is to kind of persuade the leads and leagues and point them in the right direction. Yeah. Um, and from a technical perspective, you know, we are absolutely pushing multi-formats um, and that, that's of benefit for the players. And anyone who wants to argue any differently, you know, I'm, I'm just not hearing it. I'm just, come on, let's let's see what it is because I'm not sure what the argument is. Um, so why would you not want to play different formats and, and understanding what... Well, oh, yeah. I'm starting. So the, I yeah, think but, it, it won't be an agreed. Yeah, so... Point, yeah, I, yeah I, I think, you know, I think playing... And, if, if I'm putting my foot in it in it, so just to go and play, rather than sometimes training, go and play against another team. I think it is, I know sometimes that's got to get the nod from the county FA and all the rest of it. But actually that's quite good, just playing matches and playing games. And, and if you've got those, you know, why wouldn't you want to do that on a Wednesday night and then play your, your 7v7 or your 9v9 on, 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 on the weekend? Um, mm. so why wouldn't, you know, if... Some weeks play 5v5, some weeks play 7v7. You know, if the facilities that you've got only lend it to do a particular format, go and play it, but get the kit on and go and play. Um, and I think the tough one, we, and this is the organisation bit, you know, about the, the, the kids are really missing out on this, um, not unregulated, but um, informal play. Sturge talks about it loads, and there's an organisation we talk about it loads. We need the informal stuff. You know, everything's formal, everything's league, everything's organised, and you know, and that used to be on the schoolyard, and then, but we 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 just need to kind of replicate it. Interesting enough, there was um, we've got like a little grass pitch at the back of our house here, and um, on on the park for the past three or four nights. There's been a tennis side game with the youngest kid has been six on playing, I think. The oldest kid is about 60. And there's, um, yeah, so there's that like everything. There's 30 year olds. There's an absolute mass game. There's, it's, there's, tw there's not much social distancing going on, but oh, there's dear. 20 and kids playing. And he just thinks, you know what? Part of me is really annoyed. But then the other part of me thinks, ah, here we go. This is. Why can't they just have loads of this? Because they're, oh, they're, they're loving it. Absolutely yeah. loving it. Just to no, remind I'm people, not, social no, distance. <laughs> <laughs> Please social distance. What Ian yeah. was meant is the, the, the football, the informal football, Ian. Definitely. Informal, yeah. Informal football, let's get it on. <laughs> um, uh, Louis says, we were relentless with our local county fair and an under 10, 12 and 14 league was set up last season. Um, but I think you have to work with your local clubs to set one up. Yeah, so, and, and I think thing with that is Louis worked tirelessly for years and years and years to get that to a point where it's going and 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 it's really really hard um but you know I, I think the more and more people has, has seen that that's that that could be the way forward and yeah. um but I think it, it comes back to culturally about you know we, we don't want to rush to the bigger stuff and, mm. and and it's really hard because we'll you know Wednesday night we're going to put Sky Sports on and we're going to hear about tactics and and suddenly, it's 11 v 11, so we think we've got to talk about tactics, play 11 v 11, where actually we might want to be looking at some of the smaller stuff. And, you know, will Gary Neville talk about the individual sort of particular skills of an individual player and, you know, and how they work as pairs? 
Will mm. they get into that? I'm not sure they will, but we'll talk about wing backs and all sorts of stuff. I don't know. Definitely. Don't apologise, by the way, Louis. If you need any information about futsal, speak to me and I'll pass on to someone else. But no, um, <laughs> all jokes aside, like yeah, we're more than happy to to look in, into ways to, to help you develop in your in your Milton Keynes area or, or any other area. Um, right. Final, final question is: yeah. uh, I know you support obviously Man City, um, Ian. Yeah. Um, out of the current game, whether that be like in, internally. Um, at the FA or like at grassroots or in the elite pro game, what which coaches do you admire um, and why? Yeah, it's funny. Um, if 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 people want to, there's a few people actually. So um, I think Gareth Southgate talks so much sense, and when you talk about knowing the players, that mm. is the one thing that he has done to an absolute T. And he's, he's lived and breathed it. And it is no, it's not a fluke, you know, that kids have come through the 21s that he's had and then come into the national team. And there's a trust and a bond between him. So, uh, you know, if, we, if we're saying that's really, really important, that's what he's done. And mm. he's trusted them to do the right thing. You know, and when there was a bit of nonsense, how he dealt with that was just phenomenal about how, you know, the, the internal nonsense within the group, it was, it was yeah. sorted out. Um, and and I've been fortunate to be around him a little bit, you know, within meetings and some of the some of our day to day work. Um, interestingly enough, him and Steve Holland are really interested in in the pairs work that we do in futsal. Okay. We went in to present twenty minutes. We're in two hours later discussing combination play, which leads me on to the next bit. So there's working with Mike Scabala is a real his eye for detail is just phenomenal. Okay, and and. And the players within that group, the, the detail is on another level. So him, and if you get to see any Paul McGuinness's stuff on um, that's on FA Learning, yeah. him and Paul and Paul and Scoobs are really quite similar in in the detail and what they go after. Um, and it's no fluke that you know Paul was uh, Man United youth coach for years and years and years and dealt with Rashford and Lingard yeah. and all these sorts of people. So you know it. But the, these guys, the really, the, the all of them, um, passionate about the game. They've got an absolute enthusiasm for what they do. Um, you know, Paul talks that he, he's there was um there was a, about the spirit. He's, there's another webinar about uh, just youth football and yeah. his experiences with youth football with Graham Carrick. Have a listen to that. There's some yeah. gold dust on there about him and his dad. He talks about him and his dad playing three v fifteen on the park. <laughs> and then uh, his dad was Wolf McGuinness, who was one of the Busby babes. And Paul was 18 and a youth player at Man United at the time. But they were playing on the field um, at the back of their house, 3v15, taking on everybody. But they've got this spirit of football. And yeah. if, you're, if you're in Paul's company, it just comes over loud and clear. Yeah. It's, it, it's tremendous. So there's, I think we're really fortunate at the FA to have some really, really, um, you know, look, you look at Klopp. He's the same, isn't he? he mm. You'd want to play even though Liverpool's yeah. going to win the league, you would want to play for Klopp and you can feel his enthusiasm and his excitement for the game. Yeah. You know, in the same way when you see Guardiola get so excited about stuff and, and and the way, I mean, as a City fan, what he's done is just ridiculous. You know, Pep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've been watched rubbish for 30 years and, and then suddenly this guy comes along and, and you're beating Real Madrid away. Well, come on, what's... It's <laughs> dream time, isn't it? <laughs> That's some great one there, mate. It's funny you should say that because around like coaches you admire, and I'm not making you blush here, but I don't know if you remember, but you did my level two in the Isle of Man six oh, years ago. Yeah. Remember? <laughs> See, I was left this to the very end. Was it oh, raining all the time? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. The so I, <laughs> I used to live in the Isle of Man. You come over and did my level two, and you about two minutes into the level two at yeah, the bowl, if you remember, you yeah. said, and it always stuck with me, you said, um, after you do this course, you'll never watch football ever the same again. Yeah. And to this day, I've never watched football the same again. Yeah. yeah. So, mate, Good you job. honestly, you, and that whole course was fantastic. The way you and Brido uh, delivered it, and um, it made like it pushed me as, as a development as my own co uh, my own coaching development yeah. it improved that and my experiences. So, thank you and thank you, you for your time today. Quiet, you? I know I left it as a bombshell wow. at the end. Outrageous. I can't, I'm not having that. That's a question. <laughs> you passed me, just. <laughs> just. Nah, it's been an easy pass, I'm sure. 
But no, mate, thank you, thank you so much uh, for today. I appreciate it. it went a little bit over time. Oh, um, it's great. It's great to get you on. As you said, you mentioned Graham Carrot we had on last week. We're trying to get Paul McGuinness as well. So we, we've got we have got a, a plethora of ta- talent at the FA. And we're trying to get these guys um, in while we're in this uh, current situation. So, but but thank you. Absolute pleasure. Anytime. Well, thanks, thanks everyone for sticking with it. I hope I didn't waffle on too much. The um, yeah, I mean, if there's if people need more stuff around futsal, clearly Louis the man locally who's who has got lots and lots of the answers. Um, but if you need stuff off us, again, go through the county um, and we'll do what we can. You know, there's, we've got that much material. It's no good it's sat in, sitting on people's laptops. We just want to share it. Yeah. Um, it's, futsal ain't going to go away anytime soon. Um, you know, and, and there's, there's some really good work. And it really links in, I think, with the, with the next plan, our next strategic plan at the FA. I think it'll, it'll have an even bigger piece, even bigger part to play. Definitely. And go to the boot room and FA Learn YouTube page as well to see all the content that he is. hundred percent. Yeah. And there's more stuff going up on the boot room as well. So, um, and on YouTube, it's an absolute great resource. And you do it guys. Thanks so much. Um, we'll see you very soon. Hopefully Saturday we'll have something going on with Mark Lee, but I'll let you guys know by email, but thanks. Enjoy your rest of the union.